Welcome to another episode of Too Close to Home, the series where we dig up creepy stories, haunted places and mysteries from our very own Patreon's hometowns. In this episode, we'll be looking at James, Caleb, Spencer, Jules and Annabelle. And do we have some good stories in store for you five? If you want us to dig up stories from your area, head on over to Patreon and join our Too Close to Home tier. Thank you everyone for supporting us. And now it's time to hit those lights. Sit back and enjoy. James McKay, Norfolk, Norwich, England. Norwich is a city and district of Norfolk, England, and like a lot of English cities, it has quite a quirky past. It is also the hometown of James, our very valued patron. For you, James, we're going to start with a notorious modern serial killer named Steve Wright. Norwich is not known for its serial killers, however in 1958, one of the most prolific serial killers in England was born there. His name was Steve Wright. After a stint in the Royal Navy, Wright went on to be the landlord of the Ferry Boat Inn in Norwich. He also managed a pub in South London, but lost both jobs due to his gambling and heavy drinking. After one failed marriage, in 2001, Wright met his partner, Pamela, and the couple moved to a house in Ipswich. However, unbeknown to her, Wright was frequently visiting prostitutes throughout their relationship, and he was so well known to the local sex workers that they named him Mondeo Man. But towards the end of 2006, the Ipswich prostitutes started going missing, and between the 30th of October and the 10th of December of that year, five young women were found dead in either areas of water or on the side of the road. Wright regularly visited all the victims, all had been strangled but not sexually assaulted, and two were found on the same day. Forensic evidence led to the arrest of Wright on the 19th of December 2006, after tiny specks of blood from one of his victims was found in the back of his Ford Mondeo. Wright was found guilty of all five murders on the 21st of February 2008 and sentenced to life imprisonment with a recommendation that he should never be released. Over the years, Wright has been investigated in connection with other unsolved murders and disappearances in Norwich, London and Ipswich. Experts have highlighted that it's unlikely for any serial killer to start killing at 48, the age Wright was when he committed the murders, and that serial killers almost always start killing before their mid-30s, indicating that it's highly likely Wright had killed before. He is currently incarcerated at HM Prison Long Latin in Worcestershire, England. Norwich Castle Next for you James, we'll move on to Ghosts and Norwich Castle, a place that appears to be teeming with them. Norwich Castle is now a museum, but back in the day, it was not only a fortress, but also a prison, and the site of public hangings. With such a dark history, it's no surprise that more than one disgruntled spirit lingers after death. One of the most infamous is the Floating Skull, an anomaly that has been witnessed around the castle keep. It is only visible for a few moments before vanishing into thin air. The head is believed to be Robert Goodale, who was hanged at the castle in 1885 for murdering his wife. His hanging was botched and his head was ripped from his neck as the noose fell. Another ghost is that of Robert Kett, a man who led a group of 10,000 rebels in what is known as Kett's Rebellion in 1549. He was later charged with treason and gruesomely hung from Norwich Castle. Over the years, several sightings of his body hanging in a cage from Norwich Castle have been witnessed, and some have also encountered him around the Castle Mal loading bays, which were built directly below where his body would have hung. Lastly, there is the Black Lady, a full-bodied apparition dressed in black Victorian clothing. Sightings of the Black Lady date back as far as 1820, when prison records state that prisoners were scared half to death by a ghostly woman dressed in black. More recently, she has been spotted in the grounds of the castle and in the art gallery that was once part of the prison. The ghost is thought to be Martha Alden, who on the 18th of July, 1807, murdered her husband by cutting off his head. She then took his body to a dry ditch in her garden before moving it two days later due to the smell. His corpse was eventually found in a pond. Martha claimed she killed her husband because he threatened to kill her 
and was drinking away their inheritance. Despite her pleas, Martha was found guilty and hanged in Norwich Castle, the place she now haunts. James, we'd love to know if you've ever been to the castle, and if so, what was your experience like there? Caleb Denley, Summerdale, Alabama. Summerdale is a rural town in south central Baldwin County, Alabama. It was named after its founder, Ellie Summer, who established a tobacco farm in the area in 1904. It is also the hometown of our value patron, Caleb. We're going to look at something a little different for Caleb, that is unique to Summerdale. It is called Alligator Alley, the home of Captain Crunch, a huge alligator who measures 13 feet long and weighs over 800 pounds, with a record bite strength of 2,982 pounds. He is just one of over 150 alligators that live on 20 acres of swampland in Summerdale. Many of the alligators that live there have been rescued from dangerous places and now roam freely around the large swamp. The farm is open to visitors, and if they are brave enough, they can walk on the boardwalk through the cypress swamp and feed the gators. What an experience that must be. We'd love to know if you've ever done that, Caleb, or if the alligators ever escape. From alligators, we move to ghosts in the creepy Woodhaven Dairy, located just a few miles from Summerdale in Silver Hill. The original dairy farm would have been an essential part of early life in the town, although we could find little information on its early existence. Up to a few years ago, it was buried deep in woodlands and only accessible by foot, and was reported to be incredibly creepy and allegedly haunted. Stories tell of two small boys who drowned in a well on the property, either by accident or foul play, and their troubled spirits are said to get up to all sorts of paranormal mischief. This includes running and playing around the dairy at all hours, day and night, and thundering down the hallways of the old farmhouse. In the past, people have told how one of the boys flew down the stairs and burst through a window on the bottom floor. It is thought that they are also responsible for some of the unexplained fires that have occurred in the area and the dead wildlife that turns up in unexpected places. However, the children are not the only anomaly in the old dairy. A tall black figure with red eyes has also been witnessed in the back barn a place not even the dead souls of the children dare to enter. Apparently this barn always has a strong stench of old blood and flesh. We couldn't find any recent information on whether the old buildings are still there, and we'd love to know if you've ever explored the place, Caleb. We did track down an old video by YouTuber Nick Fox, who explored the area back in 2012. Take a look. Jules Maher, Sydney, Australia. Sydney is a vibrant city known for its stunning beaches and iconic opera house, and our patron Jules is lucky enough to call it his hometown. First for you Jules, we're going to take a look at Wakehurst Parkway. Visitors to Sydney are always warned to stay away from a busy road just north of the city because for years it's been dubbed Australia's most haunted highway. Travellers have frequently reported sightings of a mysterious female figure, with claims the apparition has even appeared in the back seat of people's cars before disappearing. The ghost named Kelly is thought to be that of a woman who was killed in a car accident along the road. Kelly sometimes appears on or beside the road late at night and disappears when motorists swerve to avoid her. She's been described as looking like a nun or wearing a wedding dress. However, recent investigations theorize she may be a nurse who worked at another haunted place, Manley's Quarantine Station, a place where thousands of travelers arriving in Sydney by ship were sent between the 1830s and 1984 to prevent them spreading disease. Many people died in the site's hospital, and maybe Kelly was one of them. We'd love to know, Jules, if you've ever experienced anything along that stretch of road. Next up, we'll take a look at The Rocks. The Rocks is a historical area in Sydney's city centre that has some of Sydney's oldest pubs. 
Today, its passageways are a popular tourist hotspot with open-air markets selling street food and handmade fashions. However, in the past, this now bustling area had a much grislier history, full of death and disease. First, we'll look at Cadman's Cottage, built in 1816. It's the second oldest surviving residential building in Sydney, with stunning views of the harbour, and today is used as an information centre. However, don't be fooled by its quaint facade, because back in 1844, it was the site of some pretty gruesome stuff. A man named Jean Vidal brought a chest to the cottage that was emitting a foul smell, but despite the overpowering odour, he tried to hire a boatman to dump the chest out at sea, explaining that the smell was due to rotting pork. The boatman was suspicious and alerted the police, who opened the trunk and found the dismembered, partially burned corpse of Vidal's boss. Vidal was later hanged for his murder. Gannon House is another building with a dubious past. Nowadays, it's an art gallery and coffee shop. But back in the day, Michael Gannon, a carpenter who had a workshop on the site, and given how prolific death was in the rocks at the time, he focused mainly on making coffins. This eventually led him to becoming an undertaker, and the place where he kept the bodies is now the coffee shop. Something to think about as you sip on your brew. Next, we'll look at the Russell Hotel, formerly the Port Jackson Hotel. The hotel is built on the site of a former convict's hospital and occupies a corner position on George Street. Nowadays, it's known for its hospitality and signature cocktails. However, it's also thought to be the most haunted hotel in Sydney. Over the years, the hotel was utilized as both a sailor's hostel and a brothel, and as an unnamed sailor who was said to haunt the building. Allegedly, he was killed by a sex worker in room eight, and his spirit has lingered ever since with both hotel staff and visitors, feeling his presence through creaking floorboards and unknown footsteps. But perhaps the most disturbing thing about this ghost is he tends to manifest when women are sleeping alone in the room, often scaring the life out of them by appearing at the foot of the bed. Apart from room eight, rooms 20 and 24 are also paranormal hotspots. And downstairs is said to be haunted by a woman in either a white maid's outfit or a nurse's uniform in fact, the whole hotel is plagued by dismembered footsteps, malfunctioning electronics, sudden drops in temperature, and a general feeling of uneasiness. We wonder if you have ever stayed there, Jules. Spencer from Augusta, Georgia. Augusta, Georgia is a city that lies across the Savannah River from South Carolina. It is Georgia's third largest city and is internationally known for hosting the Masters Golf Tournament. It is also the hometown of our value patron, Spencer. It seems Augusta is riddled with ghost stories, and for you, Spencer, we're going to look at just a few of them. We'll start with Meadow Garden. Meadow Garden is one of Georgia's oldest dwellings and was once the home of George Walton, one of the youngest signers of the Declaration of Independence. Today, it's a National Historic Landmark that is open to the public. However, in the past, it has a history of paranormal activity that in 1903 hit the local newspapers. Apparently, a doctor who was visiting the house entered the front parlor and became enveloped by a strange, unearthly light. He then reportedly saw an apparition in the form of an early settler crouching down near the window, followed by the ghost of an indigenous person jumping through the window, wielding a tomahawk as if he was about to attack. As the doctor was a respected, articulate member of the community, his account was widely believed, but never fully explained. The Legend of the Haunted Pillar The story of the Haunted Pillar dates back to the 1800s, when an evangelist came to Augusta to preach on the corner near a market, but he was told to clear off. In anger, he predicted a great wind would destroy the whole town except for one pillar, and if anyone tries to remove the pillar, they would be cursed or struck dead if they touched it. The freak tornado did arrive and destroyed the market, leaving just a single pillar. The story of the cursed pillar spread far and wide, and people traveled to Augusta to view it. Many witnessed a strange aura around the pillar. Over the years, there were accounts of construction workers working near the pillar being struck by lightning or losing their lives due to freak accidents after trying to move it. There are mixed feelings about the power of the pillar, although there were many who would not touch it or go anywhere near it. The pillar is no longer standing, 
as ironically in December 2016, it was destroyed in a car collision. After the crash, it was not rebuilt, and although its physical existence has ended, the corner where it once stood is still a favorite visiting spot for tourists who want to experience its paranormal energy. Sibley Mill Sibley Mill is a historic building located on the Augusta Canal. It was built on a site previously occupied by the Confederate Powder Works and was completed in 1882. Its imposing exterior is notable for its ornate style. Textile products were produced there until 2006, but since then the building had been unoccupied apart from the ghosts of Maud Williams. On October 20th, 1906, Maud was working in the weaving room at Sibley when her jilted marriage lover, Arthur Glover, burst in. Arthur had taken the breakup badly, and in a fit of rage, he shot Maud dead. Soon after, he was hanged for a murder. However, shortly after her untimely death, workers started reporting seeing a woman, intently weaving. They recognized the woman as their former work colleague, Maud Williams. The realization that Maud had returned in spirit spooked a few of the workers, and they fled in terror. Others tried to speak to her, but received no answer. Over the years, sightings of Maud have diminished, but it's thought that her spirit still lingers within the building. The Horror of Medical Science We'll finish up with this very sad story. Augusta has long been known as one of the major centers of medical research and training in the US. The Medical College of Georgia was founded in 1829 by three doctors with the aim of training students in the medical arts. In 1852, the college bought an enslaved person named Gradison Harris and taught him reading, writing, and basic anatomy. This was highly unusual at the time, as it was illegal for enslaved people to know how to read and write. Eventually, Gradison was told that his responsibilities involved reading the local obituaries every day, then at night, going to Cedar Grove Cemetery to dig up fresh corpses for use by the medical students. One evening, some medical students saw Gradison at work and followed him to a local bar where the unwilling grave robber had stopped for a drink, carefully stashing the sack in which the evening's body had been placed outside. After seeing this, the students decided to play a joke on Gradison and removed the body from the sack before one of them climbed in. When Harris returned from the bar and picked up the sack, the student moaned that he too badly needed a drink. In terror, Gradison dropped the sack and ran down the street. Shortly after abolition, Gradison left the medical institute. However, he returned later to take a position as a porter. He died in 1911 at the age of 95 and is now buried fittingly in Cedar Grove Cemetery. But that is not the end of the story. During renovations of the college in 1989, the remains of 154 bodies, including vats filled with bones, and jars of preserved body parts were found under the building. These unidentified remains were reburied in Cedar Grove Cemetery on November 7, 1998. Annabelle, Temple, Texas Temple is a city in Bell County, Texas. It is also the hometown of our value patron Annabelle. It is one of the places Bonnie and Clyde tried to steal a car from during their time on the run. The owner of the car, Doyle Johnson, flew out of the house to try and protect his property and ended up in a struggle with Clyde and was shot. The 27-year-old Doyle Johnson, a husband and father, became yet another victim of the murderous duo. For Annabelle, we're first going to look at a lesser known serial killer, Daniel Lee Corwin. Although he was born in Orange County, California, Daniel Lee Corwin was once a Temple resident. He was born into an upper middle class religious family, but growing up struggled to fit in with his peers and showed early signs of cruelty when he killed his sister's cat. He carried out his first sexual assault as a teenager, but was never arrested for the crime after he passed a lie detector test. In 1975, he attempted to abduct and stab a classmate, but she survived. At this point, Corwin's family and the church tried to intervene, and a deal was made that saw him get 40 years in jail with a chance of parole. Within six years, Danny was out and started attending university in Madisonville. During this time, he murdered and mutilated 72-year-old Alice Martin. 
Later that year, he did the same thing to Deborah Ewing in Huntsville. Danny was questioned about the crimes, but because of his links to the church and his polite manner, he was let go. Next, he murdered Mary Risinger in front of her four-year-old daughter, and the following year, he abducted Wendy Gant, slit her throat, and left her for dead in the woods. Miraculously, she survived, but was unable to speak, but was able to help with a sketch of her attacker that was a perfect likeness to Danny. Soon, he was arrested after a tip-off from his boss, and was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, later confessing to all the murders, blaming pressure in his head. He was sentenced to death, and on December 7th, 1998, he was taken into the death chamber with small viewing rooms for the victim's families, where he died by lethal injection. Next, we'll move down the road a bit to Belton. For many years, Mary Hardin Baylor students have passed down the legend that Presser Hall is haunted. The hall was added to the original university building in 1930 and was later remodeled due to a fire in 1978 and today houses the College of Visual and Performing Arts. For decades, students have complained of strange things happening in the hall, such as the piano playing on its own, footsteps from the fifth floor, and the elevator door opening and closing for no reason. But the creepiest occurrence of all is the frequent sighting of an unknown girl looking out of the top floor window. The girl is said to be the spirit of Leona Marie Lapp, a 20-year-old senior student majoring in English. In 1961, whilst attending the university, she was engaged to Leroy Cockrell, a farmer from Salado. However, her parents disagreed with the pairing, and her mother urged Leona to end the relationship. But Cockrell didn't take it well, and on December 7th, 1961, he gunned down both Leona and her mother in the grounds of the university, as they tried to escape by car. After killing the two women, he turned the gun on himself. It's said that Leona still lingers in the building, where all her dreams were shattered. Lastly, we'll take a look at the massacre at Old Bell County Jail in Belton. The Old Bell County Jail in Belton dates back to the 1850s, and is best known for an incident that happened there on May 25th, 1874. At the time, nine criminals were locked up in the jail, charged with various crimes, including horse theft, robbery, and a man who was convicted of murdering his wife with an axe. The Civil War had ended less than 10 years earlier, and Texas was still in a state of unrest. On that fateful night, a mob of local citizens took it upon themselves to steal the fate of nine convicts by ambushing the jail while the sheriff was out of town. The convicts were gunned down in cold blood by an array of gunfire, and not one of them survived the attack. Their bodies were then dragged into the jail yard and left until they were eventually buried in a mass grave at a cemetery in Belton. Since the massacre, it is said the spirits of the prisoners remain in the building where they lost their lives. Today, Old Bell County Jail is no longer a prison, but a private residence. But over the years, ghost hunters claim to have made contact with the nine prisoners, whose residual energy remains in the area. The front of the former jail is said to be particularly active, with the words murdered, I was murdered, massacre, hanging, I was shot, being picked up on EVPs. A local dog walker had a particularly creepy experience in the jail when she was invited into the building after tripping over her lace and injuring herself. As she waited for the occupant to get a bandage, she saw a pale looking apparition appear on the ceiling above her. As she was about to scream, another appeared, and then another. The person who had asked her in had disappeared, and these horrible-looking images were all around. She quickly hobbled out of the house, and never went near it again. So that's it for this episode of Too Close to Home. We hope you enjoyed, and we'd like to say a special thank you to James, Caleb, Spencer, Jules, and Annabelle. We really hope you five enjoyed these stories from your hometown. And thank you so much for supporting on Patreon. You're allowing us to keep up what we do. Remember everyone, if you'd like your hometown featured on an episode of Too Close to Home, then head on over to Patreon to learn more. Not only will your hometown be featured in an episode, you'll also be supporting our work, and you'll also get access to all of our exclusive documentaries over on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next video.